Mythos Busters, investigating the mystery, monsters, and madness of Arkham Horror, the card game. All right, so now that we've kind of moved on some uh, some general rules foibles, Nick, what are just some general play tips that uh, new investigators might want to be cognizant of? Sure. Um, well, Arkham, the cards in Arkham uh, follow a very similar templating and format to a lot of other card games. There's what's called flavor text or lore um, on Arkham cards, just like you'd find on a magic card. Um, I don't think little... it's been called lore text since the Star Wars CCG. But you know, that's still a very important part of <laughs> the CCG history, so I'm I still going to call disagree. it lore. <laughs> um, normally, flavor text or lore text, depending on what game you're coming from, um, is there to just provide a, a window into the world in which this card um, is depicting an action or an event or a character from. Um, and it's not really that pertinent to the game. Um, however, with Arkham, my biggest tip around flavor text is to enjoy the flavor text. Uh, it is the story, and it is ultimately the reason why you're playing these scenarios and why you're playing through this campaign. So read that flavor text and enjoy it. Now, I don't follow my own rules or my own advice. Uh, when I'm playing solo, uh, especially if... If I haven't played the scenario, I read everything. But if it's a scenario I've played a couple times before, if I'm playing solo, I just skip right through all the flavor text. But really, that is ultimately, again, the reason why you're playing Arkham. So you should stop and enjoy that flavor text every so often. I think that's about agree? where I'm at, too. Uh, mm. My first time through, especially when I'm playing by myself, which I think has been the case every time for every new release we've had so far. I really take my time. I like look at the art on every unrevealed location and read the flavor text before I travel mm-hmm. there and then flip it over and see if the art has changed and then read the flavor text again. And yeah, I think especially on the encounter cards, since the encounter cards are really telling the story at hand versus the player yeah. cards, which are kind of more general, flavorful flavor text. Um, yeah, definitely, definitely read those because they add lots of cool little details that you might otherwise miss. Yeah, and uh, um, the biggest reason why I end up skipping the flavor text is because I have a son who is a year old, so if I do find time to play solo, he is usually napping at that time, and I <laughs> want to get as much playtime in as I can while he's napping, so so I'll skip that flavor text. Well, also, logistical and... life complications taken into account, of course. <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, and one thing that I find really cool about the player card flavor text is not all of them are like this, but there are some that are written as if the game master of a role-playing game is is um, de- describing what's happening. Now, I don't have my cards open in front of me, so sadly, I just thought of this example, otherwise I'd have one ready to go. But I know Taunt is written in such a way that you read it, and it references you, the player, the character. It says, you do whatever, whatever. You stand against darkness. Or you. And I'm like, I was like, wow, that's actually really cool. I've never seen flavor text written like that and it kind of cements that idea that arkham is a blend between card game and role-playing game which i love um moving on from there uh, a big thing to think about and this will vary based on the difficulty that you're playing on arkham has four different difficulties but don't be afraid to commit cards to skill tests um have an idea for where you want to be what that sweet spot is how far over the test difficulty you want to be um, and then don't be afraid to commit cards to get there. Now, obviously, when you commit cards, or maybe not obviously, if you're listening to this as someone who hasn't gotten into the game yet, you're discarding cards from your hand. So you're you're saying, I am not going to use this card for the foreseeable future. It is It has no purpose in play for me. Or it's more important as part of the skill test. So you're discarding it from hand in order to boost, temporarily boost the skill test. There's definitely an opportunity cost to that. You're basically eating your card draw or future opportunities to play whatever card you're discarding. Mm -hmm. Oh yes, definitely. Um, Which can be a barrier. But you gotta live in the now a little bit. Yes. um, And depending, again, depending on your difficulty, that's going to become more and more important. In easy, you're probably not going to commit too often. In standard, you're going to commit every now and then. On hard, you're going to be committing very frequently, and on expert, uh, you're expert. You're just going to be failing tests, tests a lot. entirely. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 
Well, you're going to be avoiding them, I would think. But but yeah, the ones you don't avoid, you're going to fail. So um, you're going to be praying. <laughs> yeah, uh, and when we talk about that sweet spot, some numbers have been crunched by some very dedicated players of this game. And talking about standard difficulty in the core set campaign, uh, the sweet spot is two above the difficulty. Once you hit that two above, you're generally kind of in the clear. Now, obviously, there are factors that can change that, but. Um, in standard, two above is kind of... And I've even carried that over into Dunwich to various degrees of success. Um, <laughs> but generally, in my mind, if I'm one over on easy, I'm good. If I'm two over on standard, I'm good. Three on hard, and then just avoid tests on expert. Yeah, I think there uh, are two kind of approaches you can take to that. You can really kind of get... You, if you get a certain number of plays in, you just kind of generally acquire a gut feel mm-hmm. for where you feel comfortable. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or if you're way more into the number crunchy side, like there are definitely resources and we'll we'll mention some of them later in the episode here where we've got, you know, bar charts and spreadsheets and like probability calculations as to how well you'll do in any specific scenario being a certain number over the test in a given difficulty. Mm. So if you want to drill down to that level, what it really amounts to is knowing what your chaos bag could potentially spit out for you. Yeah, I, I mean, you can do kind of a ballpark, I guess, like lay out the chaos tokens you're playing with before a scenario, put them in order and just get a sense of like how many are above this number and how many are below, you know, like how many of these tokens will fail me if I'm two over, three over, and you can just get a quick sense of like what the magic number is, uh, barring your access to those kind of things. And I think the other thing as far as skill tests and general play tips in in that aspect of the game is just know how important this test is to you in the game. And that's something you'll get a better sense of as you play. If it's not immediately obvious, like if I fail this, I'll die, then that's obvious. (laughs) But uh, for other tests, it might be a little bit more nuanced. And it's a matter making those judgment calls is kind of what separates like how effective you'll be. So if you know that, um, you know, I should be able to pass this test. It's kind of moderately important to me. Um, then you'll probably be aiming for that magic two over in standard. If this is like a, a, a pretty important test that could have a big effect on the game, then you're going to be aiming for that three or four obviously depending on what you have available but yeah i think the point we were talking about is don't be afraid to cross that threshold from like two over to three over for example if it's really gonna make a difference like yeah you might lose out on some cards you might draw that horrible token we don't speak of but (laughs) at the end of the day you can maybe draw cards to replace what you committed and all those kind of things but you don't want to fail a test that you really needed to succeed because you were too stingy to commit the cards you needed. Well, okay, so let's cover quickly getting the last clue off of a victory point location, just for getting the victory point. Not that important to test <laughs> the killing blow on a boss enemy. Pretty important test. <laughs> kind of important. Yeah. <laughs> so everything else kind of falls in between. Yeah. Um, I think that you'll find as you play Arkham and something that I found too with each game is that it's really like what it comes down to is efficiency and it's kind of a race against the clock because every turn you're adding a doom to that agenda and if that advances all the way that's that's the most obvious form of failure Uh, and so a lot of the things you're going to be doing you're going to want to take care of in inside of one maybe two tests. and so that's kind of the barometer there is that like, okay, it may even if it may not seem like an important test, it's more important to resolve that test and be done with it than to have to spend multiple actions on your turn trying to take care of what you should have been able to do once if you had just committed a, another card from hand. Um, so that's something to consider as well is how many actions are you sinking into resolving whatever you're trying to resolve. Seems good. Nick, I'm really curious on this next one. I wasn't quite sure what this meant. Oh, you're not sure what your favorite enemies are exhausted means? Um, I, I, all right, my little story about this, and it's, it, it's, it's from Arkham Knight, so Sean, you were there, but when we were mm-hmm. reading the text on evading enemies and what an exhausted enemy can mm-hmm. do versus what a ready oh, okay. enemy can do, 
Um, it is like night and day. Like a ready enemy can do everything. He can attack you. He can move. He can engage with people. He can, you know, make coffee in the morning. He can do whatever. He can take your car. He can do whatever he wants to do. An ex- <laughs> they, let's be fair to all the she monsters out there. Sure, they. And then an exhausted <laughs> enemy uh, can't do any of that because it's way too tired and it has to just sit still and ignore everything around it for the rest of the turn. Evading is the easiest way and the most obvious way to exhaust enemies and use it. (laughs) Like, we thought we were cheat. Like, it felt like cheating, the fact that we would be evading enemies and they couldn't (laughs) do anything. Like, they just couldn't do anything. And these are enemies that, when they were ready, would affect everybody. Um, But then once they're exhausted, there's nothing. Like, they're just just a doormat. Just walk over them. Um, You can attack them without any recompense. You can... You can play the game as if they weren't there for that turn so exhaust enemies exhaust enemies exhaust enemies unless you can just straight up kill them like a guardian so there's that. yeah so it turns off it turns off engagement it turns off mm-hmm. hunter it mm-hmm. turns off uh retaliate it turns off as uh, those are the big three I'm trying to remember what else but yeah no totally agree totally agree and i think that might not be immediately apparent to new players right. like what the value of the agility skill really is mm-hmm. like there are a few cards who reference it and like, yeah, if you're in a situation where you need to get away from the enemy, it might be apparent like, oh, I need to evade this guy. Mm-hmm. But the whole setup, especially in that first scenario where you've got a big boss to take care of, of the dodge tank where someone engages the enemy for the purpose of disabling it via an evasion, do not disvalue that. Right. It, is, it sets you up for so many good things now the downside is that obviously evading and exhausting an enemy is just a temporary solution because at the end of the turn they will ready and then they'll just be waiting to be either evaded or actually dealt with um so you have to keep that in mind but evading can be a very strong tool or a very strong result um in order to take care of again that time element, that your race against the clock. Sometimes it's quicker to just evade the enemy, or sometimes it's better to just evade the enemy than it is to outright kill them. It's really this game's mechanical call for a dog pile, is what it is. Yeah, <laughs> yeah definitely. Um, another tip that I... And sometimes it feels dirty, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> At first, it does. you'll get used to it, though. You'll get used to it. Um, and my next... Uh, point that i had on here is on on the show notes i have player slots right to win big now that's that's more than just gambling um and we haven't really talked about assets and the item slots uh but every investigator has a set number of slots and some cards that you play will fill up those slots an example would be your investigator has two hands at least every investigator we have so far has two hands so that means you have two hand slots you can hold a flashlight for instance and a 45 automatic or you can get rid of both of those and hold your shotgun which takes two hands. Um, ah, the shotgun. Ah, the shotgun. And then additionally, um, characters also have like a body slot, which generally represents armor or clothing that's being worn. Um, They have an accessory slot, which so far represents like amulets or powerful artifacts. They have arcane slots for spells, if you're a dirty, dirty mystic. And then they have an ally slot, Mm -hmm. which is probably, I would argue, the most important slot at this point, simply because there are so many really good allies that multiple investigators can take. But you only get one ally slot. So managing your slots is a big part of this game, um, especially decks that aren't upgraded to, to take slots into account. Like when you're playing with a level zero deck and you just have all those base slots, um, you really want to manage them correctly. Maybe don't play this ally right away if you're holding out for one that's a little bit better. For instance, don't throw down um, your... Now suddenly I can't think of an example. <laughs> Research Librarian, if you've also got Milan Christopher in your There name. you go. Research Librarian has a temporary um, effect or a, a, a good effect, but that's limited. Whereas Milan Christopher is a more permanent uh, alteration to the game. So, manager... I mean, unless you really need that tome, then there's an exception. But at the same time, you got one slot, so save it for the good. Sure. Well, I would argue, Sean, that your Daisy deck could have uh, could have valued, seen some value in some research librarians. But uh, but yes, Milan Christopher. That was one game. <laughs> it was one game. But he... I drew through twenty cards and didn't find <laughs> one damn old book of lore. It's not my fault. <laughs> <laughs> it happens. Right, but I even had I went through two research librarians and didn't draw or research assistants. No, no laboratory assistants. There, there we go. <laughs> I drew. I went through two lab assistants 
and still didn't find it. But yeah, anyway, corner cases aside. <laughs> right. But yeah, ultimately, you definitely I think when you build a deck, you want to know what your ideal setup is, mm-hmm. what your ideal kit is for your, your given slots. And it's okay to have kind of a few extras, but with the idea that, okay, this will get me to where I want to be. Right. Definitely. Um, and then the last mm-hmm. the last point on here um, is you live and die by your action selection. Um, and I'm honestly not sure if I put that note on there or if someone else added it later, but it's very important. I added oh, okay. it. Okay. <laughs> All right. That makes sense. So, Ian, do you want to talk about that as our, as our action bank and rogue player? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, it's not necessarily any great secret, but the kind of the core of this game is you get three actions per turn. You're never or almost never going to have enough actions and resources and cards to do everything you want. So the biggest thing that's going to determine whether you succeed or fail, other than the whims of the the chaos bag in your deck, is um, how well you choose those actions. You know, am I going to push? to take out this enemy now or am i going to use my actions to draw cards um to try to get better options to increase my chance of uh succeeding you know there's bigger philosophical questions like is it better to just throw more actions at stuff um even though you don't have a great chance to succeed or is it better to try to save up and just increase your chances of uh you know, succeeding on the few tests you take. All those kind of things are things to keep in mind. A lot of it comes just through experience um, and and trying out different things. But basically, at the end of the day, that's going to determine, you know, how successful you are is whether you're able to kind of wisely choose actions that are going to give you the best chance at success. And for a new player, um, kind of the best way to get a hang of that, obviously, is by playing but also playing with other people. And also, if you don't have access to playing with other people, watching videos that are available and seeing how other people choose actions, because then you can say, oh, I wouldn't have thought to do that there. Let me try that in my next game. Or, oh, I wouldn't do that, which is also fine. <laughs> like the shows... Mythos Busters YouTube channel, which you can be found yeah. <laughs> at www.youtube.com slash Mythos Busters. Yep. Because, uh, you know, even if you're kind of critiquing the actions that people are choosing, that's showing you're developing your sense. So those are all ways you can kind of develop your action selection skills. I don't know if you guys have other advice in that area. If the analogy helps, consider your actions as bullets in a Resident Evil game. And you want to make every one of those damn bullets count because you know that it's going to be a while before you, ra- you find a random drawer where you find extra bullets. <laughs> mm-hmm. three sounds like a lot until you have them that's all I and, yeah i mean <laughs> <laughs> it's a good analogy because it does tie into a lot of what happens in the game like there's so much that goes into it that we kind of can't cover it that's sort of like an episode in its own but you know taking the resident evil analogy like how close are you to the end of the game that's going to determine how fast and loose you play with those bullets you know are you facing a horde of zombies or one big boss um how much time do you have to carefully aim to use that bullet like these are all things that have their analogies in this game uh, that are going to determine like I guess kind of the base of it is how much actions are you devoting to any particular thing, whether that be investigating a location or killing an enemy or whatever, and asking yourself whether that the number of actions you're spending ju- is justified by, you know, what you're trying to do with those actions. All right. Any any general play tips before we put a bow on that piece and move on to other community resources? Play a lot is my other general play tip. Just play a lot and try different things and learn from your failures because you will have them. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> I think kind of going along with the, the earlier flavor text point is just in general, even if you've played a scenario a lot, let the story breathe, you know? It, it's easy to get stuck in the kind of just mechanics of I play this, I play this, I reveal this, now I reveal a token. But take a moment to, you know, if you're the kind of player who enjoys that, maybe you're just pure robot and you just like (laughs) going through the motions. But yeah, don't be afraid to take a moment and think about, huh, what does this represent in story terms and really kind of 
get those stories out of it because that's what this game does really but well. But Ian, my well, son, hand in hand with, I would say my son could wake on. up at any time, so I'm skipping that flavor text. <laughs> <laughs> that, Again, that's an exception. That's a fair <laughs> exception. <laughs> Real life logistical complications taken into account. Uh, but the other thing I would add is is one of my main pitfalls that I continue to struggle against as a player is try not to get too invested in the I win, I lose mentality. Mm. Yes, because yeah. it will really hurt you in this game in enjoying the narrative. Because if you, I mean, honestly, and I, I struggle with this again myself, like I want, you know, if I'm playing Agnes, I want her to succeed at every test, blast every enemy, discover every clue, just like be badass all the time, nonstop. But it's Agnes. But if you, but if you were, shut up. <laughs> if, you, if you were watching that movie... That would be super boring. Yeah, everyone would be like, "Who are these Mary Sue characters?" And exactly. <laughs> the internet would be would be picking apart that character at every Worst opportunity movie ever. So, yeah. so instead of getting angry at the failures, try to try to find a story explanation or a, a character moment where this is a moment we falter. This is, you know, why why do we fall down, Master Bruce? <laughs> Because we relied Make it into on that Agnes. kind of moment. <laughs> <laughs> um, to to kind of build off of your point too, Sean is uh, now it, this game is presented as a card game, like it's a card game ultimately, and it's going to you're gonna a lot of you're gonna go into it with card game mindsets. How can I build the best deck? How can I get the best efficiency out of my plays? That sort of thing. But um, you'd be surprised at how many people don't do that. <laughs> what? Well, uh, Sure, I probably would be actually surprised at how many people don't do that. But assuming that you do, random person uh, that's listening to this podcast who is very much unlike everyone else. Um, Steve. Steve. Yeah, we're looking at you, Steve. Um, my advice would be to treat it like a role-playing game. Even though it's presented mm-hmm. as a card game format, treat it like a role-playing game. And make decisions, especially the narrative ones, like at the beginning or an end of a scenario, or even in the middle, where it says... Make a choice. And there's no real game mechanics obviously tied to that choice. Think about what your who your character is and what your character would do would do. Now again, I don't take my own advice. I don't do that. Despite having <laughs> such a love of role playing games. But um but I think it's it's a very interesting way to approach it and it's going to broaden what you would expect from this as a card game. Yeah, it's it's a good point because I was actually thinking about this whole topic yesterday because I've been running a, a Zoe Rex two-handed campaign and for newer players you might not know exactly what that means yet, but essentially they've been just destroying every scenario, like no problem, not even breaking a sweat. Um, and I started a Skids and Daisy two-handed campaign, two of the core investigators, and it's just like, some Night of the most bu- bu- bumbling <laughs> moments you've ever seen, Espe- especially the first scenario I played. But then the second scenario was so amazing because I had this role playing moment where I thought in my head, like, I'm not going to spoil anything because this is for new players, but I had a choice whether to go kind of an easier way to win the scenario or the high risk way. And I was thinking in these characters' heads, like, they just failed this first scenario so bad, like, Daisy is going to step up at this moment and be like, no, you know what? We are going to go all out and take the risky moment. And it made for one of the most fun games I've had because it wasn't assured because they had these weaknesses and the story was built up. Like I, I totally second what you guys are saying, like Lord of the Rings. I feel like I tend to be more of a mechanical player in a lot of ways. And let's just play this and, you know, not taking a lot of time to think about the story. But I think in this game, the role playing aspect really, comes out so don't get discouraged if you lose that first scenario or lose a scenario along the way or it feels like losing uh, because you do have the opportunity of getting a really amazing story out of it you know it's 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 kind of like a lot of times players who are new to rpgs or say new writers they create these really like perfect characters who are just like rambo and go out and can do everything <laughs> But the really interesting stories, the really interesting role playing comes from the actual weaknesses, not from the things they do well, you know. So I don't know. If, it, it's just it's just a plea to embrace what this game is all about, which is it's not always about the winner or loss. It's about the stories you build up throughout. 
For sure. And inevitably, as this game moves, regardless of the, the designer's intent, there will be investigators who just end up being more powerful than others and, and mm-hmm. builds that are just extremely efficient and win everything. But your best battle stories come from your tensest moments. So, I, I, I mean, I think some of the, you know, we have in the secret class, like we've mentioned before, we've got Daisy versus Rex currently in the card pool. Rex is a monster. And Daisy is fun? Yeah, that's all I got. But uh, but some of the <laughs> most fun I've had playing in this game has been a solo Daisy build where <laughs> kind of the the deck is a little bit stacked against her in a lot of ways. And, and pulling her irons or her ass or whatever it happens to be out of the fire has resulted in some of the most fun moments I've had. So I guess my ultimately my... My struggle is not to shy away from the tense moments because, you know, ultimately you want to win. But at the same time, those tense moments are what really make the fun stories and the great experiences come out. So don't shy away from them. Yeah. Mm Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. All right. So uh, now let's move on to some silly stuff that we all enjoy. Now that we've talked about the game, let's talk about those those select few of us who have that special special weakness of, of being. Well, I, I refer to myself as a, as a component whore, but you know other terms might be a game pimper or a, a, I don't know. There bling might be a, master. There you go, bling master. <laughs> so, a couple of common things you might do to to upgrade both the accessories of this game and kind of the, the, the physical trappings of the card game itself. So obviously, we could probably do an entire episode on sleeves. I, I won't lie to you. We yeah. pretty much already did. I think we kind of did. So yeah. I, I can't even remember what episode that was. But it's let's like three just, or four. Yeah. So if, if you're interested, go back to our early episodes and check those out. Um, so for my, my part, let's just each go around and kind of go with what our preferred approach is because there are so many out there we can't even hope to cover them in a single segment of an episode like this um i try to find a, a a decent balance between quality and feel versus price so what i end up going with is i sleeve everything both player cards and encounter cards in the ultra pro clear sleeves um they're a really nice tight fit they give just a nice firmness and and fit to the card there's not a whole lot of flippy flop going on at the top of the cards some some of those sleeves really feel like you're drowning the card in them and i'm not a big fan of that um so so you can get like a hundred of these sleeves for like six seven bucks depending on how many you buy at a time so they're a really nice deal now what people will tell you is that the the ultra pro hologram that comes along with them is a sticking point and you know i understand why for some it might be I don't see it. At the worst, you can stick it on the back of the card and just see it on the back of the card and not have to worry about it when the cards are in your hand or on the table. But at the end of the day, for me, uh, those Ultra Pro clear sleeves are, are really kind of the nice balance of cost to, to protection. And I really, really wish I was getting some kind of sponsorship kickback for that endorsement, but I'm not. <laughs> It was a very erotic endorsement. <laughs> <laughs> Just needed some Barry White in the background. It would have been perfect. <laughs> um, for my part, I use Dragon Shield sleeves, which are on the expensive end. These are kind of the investment sleeves where you're going to pay a premium for each pack. I use the Dragon Shield clears because I like the arkham horror card game backs too much they to are cover them so up. pretty they are and it also helps because then it makes it easy that you can just buy one type um there are some other options out there but i won't go into too much detail but there's you know matte matte clear and all kinds of colors uh but dragon shields are basically kind of the the approach you go if you just want to pay uh a solid investment into the sleeves and hopefully not have to worry about them for a long, long time. Yeah. I, um, 
a lot has changed since the last time since our episode where we talked about <laughs> I know, card I was about storage. to say when we talked about card blinging you were like the resident Jawa where you were just scavenging <laughs> from other games <laughs> yeah I I used to use um, loot crate boxes I used to use card deck boxes from other games magic fat packs that didn't have magic cards in them anymore um, and then I would use colored sleeves that I had lying around from everything and and across all different kinds of colored sleeves dragon shields ultra pros um bunch of them uh however i have since changed my stance primarily because a i change my i alter my decks and change which decks are current too often that taking them all out of blue sleeves and putting them into red sleeves just took too long and it was too much of a time time issue and also because the background of, or the the card backs of each card are so beautiful like we talked about especially the player cards um i love that card back that i really wanted to have clear so i knew i like dragon shield they're a good product so i have upgraded to using dragon shield clears for my cards um damn they're, the full 180 they're yeah they're not well dragon shields are nice and I, I if i was going to commit to something i wanted to i wanted to commit to something that i i would feel confident in dragon shields aren't like so slippery that your deck just kind of falls apart when it's just sitting there but they um yeah, they're good. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like there's a there's a big penis joke to be made somewhere in this sleeve this sleeve discussion, but we're gonna go ahead and leave it there. Maybe a little so, penis joke too. <laughs> well, oh, <laughs> <laughs> it's all right, Nick. It happens yeah, man, to a lot don't of guys. leave anyone out. <laughs> right? Yeah, we want to embrace all of our. Never mind. I'm gonna stop there. Yeah. <laughs> so now, as far as general card storage goes, like we could talk for that, uh, you know, to that at at length as well but like <laughs> there are youtube videos there are lots of reviews on general card storage i don't think any of that pertains specifically to arkham um so i i personally use the the hobby lobby artist supply case uh, which is something you can pick up at any hobby lobby or the website generally runs about i think 45 25 to 40 bucks depending on whether you can get it on on sale and then go seven is the the supplier where I bought actually an insert that comes unassembled. You assemble it, insert it into the frame of this supply case, and then it holds many, many cards. I've got everything that's been released for this game, two cores, all the expansions and the standalones, and I still haven't touched half of the storage that's available in this case. So recommended for me if you're willing to throw in a little bit, but I think all said I spent probably 60, 70 bucks plus shipping on on the thing so it it does also depend on the flip side for my other games i also use just kind of the the really low-end shoeboxy um boxes i suppose (laughs) whatever those are called you can find them at just about any game store or online they're like three bucks a piece and they certainly are serviceable they're not pretty but they do the job Yeah, I use the same uh, case storage solution as Sean does, just a different model. You can look at the various models on their website. Um, As far as the Go7 inserts, there's broken token inserts. Uh, There's the cheap kind of white box approach, the shoebox approach that Sean mentioned. Some people prefer binders for their player cards. That's also an option. Um, There's just the whole array depending on kind of how easily you want to be able to take cards in and out um how much you want to spend on it how much you care about how it looks the aesthetics of it all those kind of things i um again for the longest time i was using just general deck boxes and whatever um but in order to keep this combo going i too use the (laughs) hobby lobby artist supply case with the go seven god guys we are missing out on those kickbacks what the hell (laughs) (laughs) i know we should have (laughs) diversified yeah and for me it's ultimately just about having all my cards in one place and then when i open up that case i know what's what and i can be like all right this is these are my guardian cards this is my deck this is the whatever encounter um, whereas before it would be, I want to play Arkham, grab my four different boxes of different <gasps> sizes and colors, open them all up and go, okay, what did I have in here? <laughs> that again? are all kind of shoved higgledy piggledy into the corset box that doesn't fully close yeah. because it's not actually set for the <laughs> width of a regular card. Right. Yeah. So, um, for me, it was all about having it all in one place and, and being able to easily access all of those cards. So, yeah. Also, I didn't think I was going to be able to get the words higgledy piggledy into this podcast, but we got it guys. You got it. 
where there's some okay will. so moving away from general card accessories which you could talk about for any card game ever let's talk about arkham specific ones so i think one of the biggest pieces that that people will look to upgrade or or supplement on their own mostly because it's not included in the core box is the chaos bag so Mm -hmm. it's pretty easy to go out and find just your standard dice bag they sell them everywhere online they're pretty cheap um you know, one thing, though, that I would recommend is looking at some dice bags that have actually some structure built into them that actually have kind of the four corners and, a, and an ass on them, a bottom. So that the chaos bag can actually kind of sit almost like a cup on the table until you need it. And then there's almost there's something different about actually having a bottom to the bag versus having just kind of an indistinguishable fold in the bag that helps that helps pull tokens out, I think. Um, and so to that end, one of our one of our friends of the show, Kenji, who's in our Discord, actually has an Etsy shop. You can find him at Geekcraft. I definitely recommend checking that out. He does really good work uh, with with he's got several different icons that you can put on a dice bag uh, with with custom embroidery that looks just freaking gorgeous. Um, we've talked about it on prior episodes. If you want to check those out, go ahead. But highly recommended. I have. I got my purple uh, with starry field on the inside with an elder sign on the outside di- or a chaos bag. And I have never, ever looked back. That thing is just so pretty. And I'm always glad to put it on the table. So Ian, I know you, you in particular have something that's a little outside of the bag, if you will. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I do have a Kenji bag as well, the black and green for rogues, uh, which is something I use quite often. I also have a kind of Cthulhu tentacle, like goblet type thing that I got off Etsy. Um, and so Etsy is a place that you can look for. There's other kinds of chaos bags, all kinds of Cthulhu related stuff that's available there. Um, that will probably tend to be a bit more expensive depending on what it is, but you could get those kind of, you know, one of the kind things or things that are specifically made for Arkham. Uh, and beyond that, if you're not really looking to spend a ton of money, I mean, there's stuff you can use around the house that's fine. You can use your sock, you can use a cup <laughs> that lets you reach into it. Those are all options as well. The sock, personally recommended by one of the designers of the game, by the way. Yep, the yeah. chaos sock. Chaos sock. <laughs> Nick, how about you? What are you rocking? I know we used mine last time we played, so I'm not even sure what you're what you've got going on. I actually use the Elder Sign dice bag that we got at Arkham Knights. Um, I have okay. I have like hmm. five or six dice bags, and three of them are Cthulhu related. So I could really just swap in <laughs> and out with those. However, um, I think it would be really cool to get like one of those little like um gumball machine type things and load all your tokens in there and then when you need to draw a token just twist the thing and pull out your token and it's always going to be bad so it's like you're playing with a little like a bingo ball dispenser yeah yeah that's actually a good idea too you need to have a one with a pretty big (laughs) opening to get those tokens out but no i just i just use dice bags i know custom engraved bingo balls yep we've solved it guys (laughs) okay so beyond the bag itself which is you really can take the form of any vessel, essentially. All you need to be able to do is a blind draw. You could literally just spread your tokens out on the table, shuffle them around with your hands, and look away and grab one, and it would probably still be okay. But beyond the bag... <laughs> madness, madness. Yeah, no, madness, <laughs> madness, that way lies. Um, one of the other big things that I would highly, highly recommend doing is coin cases for the stock tokens in the box. So the stock chaos tokens in the box, and honestly, like, I know we've covered this before, but I feel like for upgrades in general, this game is hard because the tokens in this this game are kind of among the best of FFG's work. Yeah, I agree. So to that end, one of the biggest recommendations I'd have is actually just to enhance what's already there as opposed to replace it, which is some of, you know, one of our other recommendations are going to be, is... uh, Coin collectors have existed for a very long time, and they have ingenuity in, invented ingenuity. Ingenuity. There's a verb there somewhere. <laughs> um, they have invented 
simple coin cases and you can buy these in uh for the chaos tokens that are included in the arkham horror bag you want to get either 25 or 26 millimeter coin cases you can get them online you can get them probably at a local coin collection shop if you happen to have one if you get the 25 millimeter they're gonna be snug and you're probably never gonna get them off or get them out which is probably okay if that's fine for you but at the same time, I like the 26 because it leaves just a tiny bit of play in the coin case for the Chaos Tokens. Um, I actually went around the edge of my Chaos Tokens with a Sharpie, which is a really, really superficial touch. But I think it adds a little bit more of a visual to them as opposed to kind of just the general cardboard corrugation feel. But you put these, uh, the, the Chaos Tokens in these 25 or 26 millimeter coin cases, and oh my god, it changes the tactile nature of the Chaos Bags so much. It does. It really does. I think that's one of the like single biggest purchases I would recommend for this game, and it's fairly cheap too. Uh, just because one of the, the only things that bothered me about the Chaos Bag was just that worry of like, are they really getting mixed up enough? And <laughs> are they getting stuck in the corners? And is this truly randomized? And with the coin cases, it kind of solves that because they're so like substantial that you can feel them move around and really get a, a chance to mix them up. And, and I don't know, just like you said, it changes the tactile feel so much that I highly recommend it. It does, it does. And the other thing is, like, the, you know, the, the regular tokens, you're moving around on the board, you might store them, you know, in a clump. So after a very long period of time, they might start to fray. But if you're anything like me, and I think like most people that I've seen play the game, those chaos tokens see some tough friggin' love. Yeah. So those <laughs> things live in the bag, they get shuffled every time you draw one out. Mine started to start... They started to whiten and get little fray marks three weeks after I got the game. So the the coin cases are a really great way to fight that. And in addition to making them more substantial on your fingers and, and being able to ruffle the good tokens up from the bottom of the bag. Um, yeah, if I was to recommend any single game upgrade, that would definitely be the one. Well, and not only that, but I mean, every time you draw that tentacle, you're throwing it across the room and running the chair over it and, you know, doing anything <laughs> you can to, to teach it a lesson and keep it in the bag. So, you know, that one especially it's is going to get worn more than the rest. But I'm also afraid of angering it. <laughs> Maybe that's my problem. <laughs> Shouting insults at the tentacle token. You just wake up and lift up your blanket and the tentacle token is, <laughs> is there next to you. <laughs> no! <laughs> Alright, so that covers the chaos bag and tokens. Now, obviously, one of the other biggest you know, the other biggest things that you're going to look to upgrade this game uh, are going to be your standard tokens and possibly your playmats. So as far as the base tokens in the game go, uh, one of the one of the most general recommendations I'd I'd put out there is that these Arkham Files games have existed for ten plus years. Uh, FFG's Arkham Horror was released in oh six, I want to say oh five, somewhere around there. So people have been making tokens for these games that are kind of cross compatible. Like clues have always been a big thing. Health and sanity have always been a big thing. There's usually some kind of eldritch or tentacle or bad token doom in this case that, that could be used so i would honestly i would look across the pantheon of token upgrades that have been produced for these arkham files games to see if there's anything that tickles you because you don't necessarily have to stick to things that were made with this card game specifically in mind right that said if you are one of the biggest ones and one of the most prominent ones that i would i would prop is team covenant uh, who are an online and, and local retailer from Tulsa, Oklahoma, uh, who we recently had the opportunity to, to chat a little bit with. They've put out very specific Mythos tokens for the Arkham Horror card game. They're acrylic, they're double-sided, uh, they're laser-etched and very, very pretty. Uh, you know, they're a little bit more on the premium side as far as price goes, but honestly, the more I play with them, the more I feel like it's justified. Um, Ian, I don't know if you you would second that notion. I know you're the only other one currently who has them. <laughs> yeah, I would. Um, definitely, after playing with them a bit, they 
you know, they are premium, like you said. They are a bit more on the higher end in terms of price, but they're very solid in terms of functionality. They work well. I'm happy with them. So, yeah, that's that's an option if you're like, okay, I've been playing this game. I'm all in. Um, I'm going to be working these tokens to death. So maybe I might want to look into an option that's more a little bit more solid than the cardboard. Yeah, so definitely check them out. If you Google Team Covenant, you'll find them very, very easily. Um, if acrylic isn't your thing and you would prefer something more along the organic line, uh, there are some pretty cool wooden tokens that are being produced and sold from Aethernet or something. But anyway, they are brought to our attention by a friend of the show, Tyler, who goes by Daff Lamrock in, the, uh, in our Discord and, and uh, Twitch, I believe. And you can find those at theshadowarchive.net. He's got a mirror for their site where you can find those. So you've got like 3D crate tokens that are actually like a full half inch tall or maybe like three eighths an inch. But <laughs> anyway, <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to think of my uh, my measurements and I was coming up short. But then they've got the clues and the doom. And as far as wood tokens go, these look really nice. I actually got to see some of these in person today. Um, so I'd definitely check those out as well. Guys, anything to add on the the actual token upgrade front? Uh, if you own, and Sean touched on this, but if you own Arkham Horror Elder Chore, you have all the health and sanity tokens you will ever need. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Repurpose thing, repurposing, rather. Not repurposement. We're just inventing words tonight, it turns out. I'm uh, keeping a record. Repurposing is a thing. <laughs> I saw that. Or add that right to the uh, the old trilogy and bothed. Bothed and trilogy. I can't remember the third one from that night, but that was like five years ago. So. Yeah. We like to invent words after 10 p.m. Um, then beyond that, playmats, I think, are kind of a, a thing. I've not gone too deep into those because I've only just now felt like I'm in a place where I've got my tokens figured out. Um, so play mats, I think the FFG ones are a nice place to look, especially their, what's the big four player one called? The four player play mat. <laughs> There's it a specific name, name for it though. that I can't oh, remember. Uh, it's the secret two player um, play mat. Right. Uh, countless terrors. Thank you, Ian, in the chat. Uh, countless terrors play mat is, uh, an oversized play mat. They produced and actually we got a sneak peek at uh, at Arkham Knights 2016. It's really nice for a play area for the encounter deck at the very least. And I think it mm-hmm. would probably comfortably accommodate up to two players in addition to the encounter deck if you're willing to be a little cozy. Um, <laughs> you know, they market it as four player and maybe that's possible if you're a little, if you're really okay with cozy and a bit of overlap. But anyway. And if nobody um, plays really any like, assets. <laughs> right. If you stand on each other's shoulders, <laughs> <laughs> you're just one guy in a big trench coat. <laughs> so four player is a little misleading, is what we're saying. But as a play mat, it's really awesome. Uh, what I like is, about that yeah. one is that the background is not busy. Um, it's got kind of like this cool alternate zodiac, uh, you know, aesthetic going on with the, the zodiac uh, actually you know, replaced with like elder gods. Um, and it's got a nice, clean place for things like the Encounter Deck, the Discard Pile, the Act and Agenda Deck. That's a really nice place to go. Now, it's been a little hard to get a hold of, as, I, as I've as i heard, at least from the, the Arkham Horror Facebook group. But if you can get a hold of it, that's one I'd look at. The other one that I want to prop is on, if you go to the Board Game Geek Arkham Horror webpage and go to the <coughs> Files section, there's a player dashboard, is what I think it's called. Mm-hmm. And it's it's a single-player player map. That has very distinct areas for your deck, your investigator, where you place horror and damage. It's got actually s- dedicated slots for the default body, ally, accessory, arcane slots. Very, very pretty. I haven't sprung on it yet, but it's my next bling purchase. Yeah, I do. I do have one of those. Basically, what you do is take the file and go to uh various sites that allow you to kind of import an image and they'll print the playmat for you i believe i use ink playmats but uh so that's an option um and just in general kind of board game geek file section is the place to go to look for different playmats people create i know people are already in the process of creating other 
kinds of dashboard style play mats and other images so if you don't like the ones ffg offers or you want to supplement that's a good place to go to to see what's what's there to to partake in um so that's kind of it in terms of the play mats uh there's the four on ffg plus the one big one there's bgg there's potentially ones you want to design yourself uh, beyond the playmats, the other kind of component that people have taken to figure out replacements for are the little miniature cards that represent your investigator on the map. Mm -hmm. And and so um, <clears throat> those are perfectly fine. Obviously, they serve the purpose. But in terms of pimping, what some people have done is there's a few options. One is the FFG themselves created a line of uh, investigator miniatures for Arkham Horror, the board game. Uh, so the problem with those is that a lot of those, about half or maybe more, are out of print, out of stock, whatever you want to call it. That's yeah, a problem. No longer available. Yeah, it's a problem. So if I remember correctly, all the core investigators are available. Um, once you start getting into Dunwich, and I imagine the further expansions, then some will be available, some are not. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to go with that option, you're just going to have to live with the fact that some of your investigators won't have your the miniature, the company miniature from FFG, if you want to kind of keep them all uniform. Right. So I've done that myself. I have the minis that are available, and... I will say, as far as quality, they're not the most beautiful minis <laughs> in terms of paint job that have ever existed. Some are a little <laughs> Some melty. are better than others. <laughs> Some are a little melty. Agnes, in particular, is a little horrifying to me. <laughs> <laughs> she should be. <laughs> and, Which is and a not, damn shame. Not, yeah, not in a good way. <laughs> um... So they they vary in quality. Most of them are fine. Like you're looking that at them from afar. You're not gazing longingly into their eyes for the most part. So they're fine. <laughs> they do their Brian, jobs. <laughs> well, yeah. One eye slightly lower <laughs> than the other. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they have a real melt problem there. <laughs> when but, she uh... goes, "Hand me that thing." Two people reach for different objects. <laughs> <in the> <laughs> So if you don't, if you're not happy with those because either the availability or the paint job, uh, I know some people have just kind of searched like other miniatures. So obviously they're not like licensed Roland or Rex or whoever miniatures, but they get miniatures that look similar to the character. Again, the problem with that is just issue of availability. You might be able to get some for some investigators, but some investigators just might not have a good, you know, uh, appropriate miniature available elsewhere. So if you're really stingy for consistency, maybe just stick with the mini cards. <laughs> yep. Uh, I guess the other option other than minis and the cards that I've seen people do is create like little circular pictures of them and then put them in the coin cases and then you have like a little smaller token that you can move around the map. Hmm. Yeah, one thing that I thought about doing was taking the plastic standees that are used in Arkham Horror the board game, which I own, mm. and sticking further repurposement and stick yeah, and sticking my mini cards in those, <laughs> and then that way they're at least standing up and they're easier to grab and move around. And I tried that, and the cards obviously are too thin; they don't stay up in the standee. So I was like, "Dang it, I can't do that." And then I was no. talking to someone on Discord about this recently, and they were like, "Well, can't you just use the cardboard cardboard pictures that come in Arkham Horror?" And I was like, "Oh my gosh, why didn't I think about that?" So. Currently, my Arkham Horror board game is packed up, so I can't check to see how many investigators cross over. But if there's enough, I think I might end up using those cardboard uh, tokens and the plastic standees rather than the mini cards. Well, yeah, I mean, you get to the same place, right? Because you can either use the standees with the mini cards and just know you have them already. Or, you know, if you happen to have the actual standees that actually kind of look a little bit better for size and scale in the standees that come with Arkham Horror or Eldritch Horror, I'll point out. Yeah, probably. And Mansions Elder of Side. Madness has actual minis. Mm. Um, again, oh, it's go. not going to cover every investigator, but you could, if you have that game, you could potentially mine that as well. Yeah, I was looking at the Mansions of Madness expansions while we were at FFG uh, this last weekend. And uh, I was I was like, oh, this one just has, you know, investigator minis. And I flip it over and it's like, well, there's one investigator 
that is, you know, currently in the pool, and then the other four are investigators that aren't in Arkmore the card game. So I'm like, well, that wouldn't be a very smart purchase. So. Except for the new Mansions of Madness is pretty cool, too. That's true. If I wanted to buy the actual game itself, <laughs> I could always do that. <laughs> best best upgrade to the card game, another game. <laughs> That's what FFG <laughs> wants you to think. <laughs> Okay, so aside from from upgrading the pieces that actually come with the game, there's a fair bit of fan-made content for this game. And I know, Nick, you've probably delved farthest into it for this game specifically. So anything you would prop on that end or kind of advise people where they might find it? Um, Well, after my recent move and living in a new situation now, I haven't had the opportunity to play with fan-made scenarios as much as I have in the past, but the ones that I have experienced have been very well made. Um, uh, Two from creator Mike Hutchinson on Board Game Geek and two from one of our own Discord Discord attendees who goes by... His name is Tim Cox. He goes by... um, Rush L or Rush Light on Discord. Uh, he actually has a three-part campaign that I believe is fully released now. But you can find all these files on Board Game Geek, and it's those scenarios plus tons of others. There's one that has entirely um, like original Arkham quality artwork in it, and it's made by uh, I want to say a French creator, and it's all in French. Um, but one of our Discord guys uh, who we actually played with at Arkham Knights, Daniel. Uh, has been working at translating it and putting the translations in a PDF for me so that I can actually Mm -hmm. eventually hopefully get to play this one. Um, It looks really cool. But yeah, there's a lot available at BoardGameGeek.com under the Variants and Files section. Sweet. So speaking of other resources where you might go to find goodies for Arkham Horror, obviously uh, you found us through one one avenue or another if you've been referred to us via forum or if you're just a regular listener who's like god get on the episode 16 where you're talking about something i don't already know about <laughs> <laughs> um i will say obviously we we produce fairly regular content for the game so if you've enjoyed what you've heard tonight definitely check us out at wordpress.com slash, or mythosbusters.wordpress.com i'll get our urls right one of these days no you won't um and <laughs> <laughs> It's probably true. I'm going to screw up one in every every go around. But anyway, uh, we, we do regular content for the game. We release about every two weeks, give or take. We, we record every two weeks. When we release, is a little bit more variable. <laughs> um, normally, we recover news, community content. We have some kind of discussion topic. Obviously, tonight is very focused on this new player segment to kind of bring people into the game. Hopefully, into Mythos Busters as well, if you've enjoyed what, you've done, what we've done here. Normally, we're a little bit more on the silly side. Tonight's been actually pretty dry for us as far as content goes because we're a little focused on this very informational piece. Um, but as far as other community content goes, where we we direct you. So first, I'd say one of the biggest places you might want to go is to find a deck builder. Deck builders really, really smooth out the, the process of building a deck in this game. You know, I love, love, love playing with my physical cards. Nothing will ever top it. But at the same time, when I'm building a deck, sometimes it's easier to do it in a very abstract format where I don't have to dig every single card out that I'm thinking of or looking at. And to that end, Arkham DB is currently the top one for me. So it's ArkhamDB.com. Uh, you'll find it there. You can basically sign up for a free account. Uh, modify which sets you currently own, which will modify what cards will show up in the actual deck builder itself. So you can actually customize the deck builder based on what sets you have and keep it all within your current card pool. Uh, And then save, you know, it's not an unlimited number, but it takes you quite a bit to get past the limit of decks that you can save in that, in that deck builder. And then of course, card game DB is FFG's uh, actual, you know, I guess owned, (laughs) deck builder so you can check that one out as well there's there's you know blog posts and forums on card game db in addition to the deck builder so definitely worth checking out so in addition to that you might want to find a visual outlet i suppose and to that end i would definitely recommend you check out the mythos busters twitch slash youtube channels uh we do Playthroughs, which are becoming a little less common just because of how hard it is to wrangle all these yahoos together on one night. (laughs) 
But in addition to that, uh, our, our card reviews, which we call, or we do under the umbrella of the Miskatonic AV Club, um, are on our Twitch and YouTube channels. So our, our podcast proper kind of stays away from the very, very specific card-by-card review format. But <laughs> some of us really enjoy doing that, so we do that via our YouTube channel. And it's, it's very nice to have the visual aspect to that piece as well. Um, as well, if you've, if you've heard of us, chances are you've heard of the Arkham Chronicle, which is probably the foremost YouTube producer for, dedicated YouTube producer for Arkham Horror. Um, they're, they're really nice, quick, short form videos. Most of them are under five minutes. He covers topics from setting up a specific encounter to, he did, I'm trying to think, he did seven minutes of video on the different options for coin cases so if the coin cases and the particulars of that dimension of game pimping really appeals to you definitely check out arkham chronicle and we've done a little bit of crossover with uh with arkham chronicle as well so check those out uh in addition to that we've got some community members who have come together to do the miskatonic files and i believe at this point they're focused mostly on game playthroughs again i think they're doing those through are they doing twitch first i've only seen the first one and that was on youtube I am not 100% sure. I think they may just be recording it and then putting it out through YouTube. Okay. We'll definitely check those guys out. We played with, I think, most of those guys at Arkham Knights as well, so they're all solid. Uh, and then as well, uh, community member Man From Lang is has done a series called Whisper in Darkness, which you can find on YouTube, where he does card reviews and different playthroughs, mostly in solo. Uh, so, Ian, you want to walk us through some of the the written word on Arkham Horror? <laughs> sure. So, there's also some blogs that are dedicated to Arkham Horror, um, <clears throat> or spend, you know, a good chunk of time talking about it. So, the first one is the Shadow Archive, which we mentioned previously for uh, kind of partnering and spreading the word about the wood and tokens. The Shadow Archive actually covers, um, according to their site, uh, Star Wars, Lord of the Rings, and Arkham Horror, uh, but they have devoted some time to uh, articles about Arkham Horror. So you can check out uh, that site if you're interested in Arkham Horror or any of those games. Um, the second one is Delve Too Deep. Um, that one is delve2deep.wordpress.com. This one is dedicated... Uh, <clears throat> specifically to Arkham Horror. And this one covers, you know, they have quite a few articles on there. It in covers uh, scenarios uh, kind of in depth. It covers each investigator in depth, giving you uh, different takes on um, the investigators, things you might not have thought of. So uh, Delve Too Deep is one that I've looked at. Definitely recommend that one. Uh, and the other one is uh, Lockwood and Associates uh blog and we can hopefully get the the url in a second here we don't have it handy but uh, i'll work on it okay sean will work on that this is another one that is devoted specifically to arkham horror the card game and again it's diving into that stuff that blogs are perfectly suited for which is looking at individual cards looking at individual scenarios uh lockwood was one of the early ones um, possibly the first from what i remember who really delved in depth into the chaos bag kind of probability and statistics in figuring out like what are those kind of number crunchy stuff about for each difficulty what are your chances of succeeding if you're over the number by a certain uh amount so that's definitely one to check out um to kind of get you acquainted with that blog I think Lockwood slowed down a little bit of late, but he can be found at ArkhamProtection.wordpress.com. There we are. Um, and finally, uh, and if we forgot your blog, um, no offense intended, go ahead and <laughs> contact us after this goes out, and we will make sure you get the appropriate plug. Uh, finally, we should mention that we ourselves, Mythos Busters, at our WordPress site, have a blog. We have a process whereby... Uh, contributors submit articles, we look them over, do a little bit of editing, publish them, usually on Thursday, Friday-ish, end of the week, depending, and <laughs> they... <laughs> <Yeah>. they cover... <laughs> I was going to say, guest article Friday is really guest article any day of the week at this point. <laughs> yeah. 
guest article surprise <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah they cover a wide range of topics because this is uh kind of our vision for it was to provide a forum for the community you know people might not necessarily want to devote the time it takes to uh, run a full blog but they can contribute these articles and so if you're a new player and you're listening to this and you get into the game um, feel free to send uh, articles our way for potential publishing on our blog the new player perspective is a valuable one because there are always new players hopping on so don't feel like you have to be an expert at the game before you start contributing uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> So as far as places to go and just chat with people who are really into this game, there's there's a really great community that's kind of sprung up around it. And there's a few different places you can go. There's a few different hot spots. Uh, the first one I'm going to plug is the one that I frequent the most personally because it's just it's the most awesome one there is. I'm just going to put that one out there, bold but true. And that's the Discord channel that we started. Um, so you can find that at discord.me slash mythosbusters. Discord, if you're not familiar with it, is just basically a communication platform really geared toward gaming in particular. I think it was probably made for video gaming, but it works just as well for card and board gaming. Um, so we have several text channels within the, the Mythos Busters Discord that you can you can be a part of. You know, we've got one dedicated specifically to Arkham, one to Lovecraft lore in general. You can go chat about any other games you want in the community, you know, in the off-topic channel. We've recently started the the esoteric order of the street date for those of us who uh, basically <laughs> abstain from player card spoilers prior to the pack actually releasing. So if you're a particular kind of mas- masochist, you can come join us there. Uh, and then as well, if you have a mind to meet up with people online and and play, you know, either you know just via voice channel or via Octagon or or Lackey or whatever other tabletop simulator or tabletop simulator itself uh, you'd <laughs> like to use, you can do that in our voice channels, which are are free to use as well to anyone who's in our Discord. So highly recommend that again. Oh wait, it's discordme mythosbusters and that's kind of the evergreen invite that you can go out and use. Um, so in addition to that, I'd, I'd prop a couple things here. So we've got the Arkham Horror LCG subreddit, which I think is, is very well moderated and very active as far as LCG subreddits go. You've got the FFG forums, which, again, you can find just on the Fantasy Flight Games website. The BGG forums, which you can find on BoardGameGeek.com and find the Arkham Horror game page and forums. And then as well, uh, the other one that I'm, I'm mainly aware of is the the arkham horror the card game facebook group it has a fair few members at this point there's generally people you know kind of sharing new experiences and maybe ask, asking some newbie questions generally sharing quite a few different game pimping opportunities so lots of pictures there on the facebook if you're into that not a bad place to go so as far as other podcasts go um, like I mentioned, we do the Miskatonic AV Club, where we dive into very specific card reviews for each individual card that's released. Right now, we're up to halfway through the Dunwich Legacy uh, expansion, and we plan to, to get current at some point in the near future, hopefully. <laughs> Maybe. Um, and uh, in addition to that being out on our Twitch and YouTube, we've actually exported the audio from those sessions into its actual, its own podcast. So we have a separate RSS under the Miskatonic AV Club. Uh, if you found us at probably our, our WordPress site, you can also find the Miskatonic AV Club under our WordPress site. It's one of the banners there. You should find it there if you want to dive into our card reviews. Definitely would recommend that. And then as well, the only other podcast that I'm aware of that focuses specifically on the the Arkham card the Arkham LCG is a little podcast called Drawn to the Flame. Now, up to this point, and if you've listened to prior episodes, you've probably heard me <laughs> apparently uh, very very convincingly feigning a, a fake adversary and feud with these guys, but they ruined it last episode by saying nice things about us on their podcast. So I'll just go ahead and say that they do a really good job. They're a little bit shorter than us. We're peaking, <laughs> we're cresting on like two and a half hours for this episode. 
Um, they generally keep their stuff to about under an hour. Uh, they focus on very specific topics as opposed to our general scattershot approach. Um, so definitely check those out. Uh, those guys out. Uh, Peter and Frank do a really good job with it. So drawn to the flame. And then the last piece that I think we'd, we've already mentioned at, the, at this point, but just want to reiterate that the Board Game Geek uh, Arkham Horror Portal has lots of different things you can experience from it. You can go to the forums to just chat or ask rules questions. You can go to files to, to find, you know, there's like custom sleeve images and play mat images and like card divider images and just all these different things you can find to bling out the game. If you go to the variant section, you'll find different maybe house rules that you might want to try out to, to modify the game for your own group. Uh, in addition to the custom quest or custom quest, custom scenarios that Nick mentioned earlier, and uh, yeah, that's that's about it for for my community resources, guys. Anything else you'd add? No, not that I can think of. Oh, um, also, Mythos Busters does have a Facebook group as well. Um, oh yeah, there's that. Yeah, there's that. So uh, if you're on, told Facebook, you I always miss one. Well, I added that as you were going through the list. So, <laughs> um, so if you're on Facebook, yeah, but in a perfect world, I would have remembered it myself. True, very true. <laughs> so check that out. Long story short, yeah, we post. Uh, we we tend to repost the uh, the FFG news as it comes out, so you can stay up to date there. Occasionally, we'll post some some gameplay you know, photos or videos. Or we we recently did one where you know, name your your cute nicknames for things that happen in the game. Which actually didn't go over as quite as well as I was hoping, but yeah. <laughs> um, hope springs eternal. And also, occasionally, uh, we we do giveaways on Facebook as well. I think we've done two now. So, yes, if any if any bone in the body is ticklish, let it be the greed bone. <laughs> um, we actually we probably have some giveaways that are that are upcoming. So pay attention to those too. <laughs> I'm glad that tickled you, Nick. This episode is too long. <laughs> it is. Okay, so let's close this sucker up. Normally what we do at the end of every one of our episodes is we do a little segment called te- Tentacle Time, where we talk about other things in our lives that are grabbing our attention aside from Arkham Horror, the card game. So rather than kind of do what, what our current ob- other obsessions happen to be in this moment, trying to keep this one a little bit more evergreen, <laughs> Let's let's recommend other games that people might want to look into if Arkham Horror is of appeal to them. So, Ian, if someone is really into Arkham Horror or the card game, what else might they enjoy? So, in the interest of time, I'm going to prop one really hard and then mention the other two a bit more briefly. <laughs> um, if you like Arkham Horror LCG, the one that I would suggest to you is the aforementioned Mansions of Madness Second Edition. Um, this is a big cooperative, cooperative game, um, from FFG it's scenario based. So each game you're playing a different scenario. If that sounds familiar, um, you play as an investigator, you have a set of actions to choose from each turn. Again, that's familiar. <laughs> um, and it obviously is delving in the same world, the Arkham Files world. So why should you bother if it sounds so similar to Arkham Horror LCG? So the difference is this isn't a card game. This is a big board game, comes with tons of tiles, comes with tons of minis for all the monsters, for all the investigators and kind of the big innovation uh for second edition is that it is run by an app so this is a cooperative game you and your friends or your or just yourself you can play it solo uh are all working together and the the app is actually running the bad guys it tells you what's happening next it tells you um you know, what kind of tests you're going to check, all those kind of things. So it does a lot of the work for you. So the reason you would get it, it's on the pricier side because it includes all those components, is because this is, like, the closest you can get to an RPG without playing an RPG. If you don't have the ability to play that or whatever, this is as close as you can get in the Arkham Files world. Um, And so I suggest that for that reason, the visuals are awesome because of all the components. Um, and the other big reason I like it and I would suggest it is this game is super, super easy to teach. I mean, it's basically, you teach people what actions they can choose. You tell them they can take two actions. You, um, tell them how tests work and that's about it because the app is going to run pretty much everything else and tell you what happens. So if you're one of those people who are a little bit iffy on apps, 
uh, and apps involvement in board games, I'd say don't be in the case of this game. It's a good game, fun, lots of stories, lots of madness, lots of craziness. Um, so Matches of Madness 2nd Edition for sure. Uh, the other two, which I'll mention more briefly, is a game called Grim Slingers. Draw! I recommend... <laughs> this game is completely different than Arkham Horror LCG, and I suggest that mainly if you're just a solo player or cooperative player looking for more games that can be played that way. <laughs> cool thing about Grim Slingers, it's kind of like a weird Westy game, is that it has both competitive and cooperative modes, so there's a ton of game in there, and it's cheap. Um, and the final one is is a game that's hard to get now because FFG lost its uh, Warhammer license. This is a small card game called Death Angel. This one's super cheap, or at least it used to be. Now you might have to pay a premium, but hopefully you can find it secondhand. <laughs> but this is hit, set in the kind of Space Hulk-like aliens-type world, fighting all these kind of insect-like aliens, uh, cooperative, and there's just a ton of like strategy to dig into with that one. But it's pretty punishing, so those are my suggestions. Awesome, Nick. It's interesting that you bring up Grim Slingers because of the solo or campaign play, um, which obviously relates to Arkham, but I only have experience with the competitive play and the dueling, and I just, I must say that I love that because it's a fighting game in card game format. I'm mean, Outside of playing Yomi, the fighting game card game, Grim Slingers is awesome. But mm -hmm. sticking with suggestions related to um, Arkham, or at least that you might be interested in if you like Arkham... I'm going to touch on tabletop RPGs, and much like Ian, I'm going to mention three, but I'm going to dig into one. Um, obviously, there's the Call of Cthulhu RPG, which has gone through, I think, five or six or seven editions by now. Um, pretty easy to learn, uh, and covers all this mythos stuff that we've been talking about this whole time, so obviously check that one out. Um, another one I want to talk about, which I only purchased for the GM tools on it, but Silent Legions RPG. I got the PDF of it from DriveThruRPG, and it has some really cool tools in there to create your own mythos of um, cosmic entities and terrors from beyond time and space. So that one's really cool as well. Uh, but the one that I really want to dive into is a little game called Monsters and Other Childish Things. Yeah, this, boy. <laughs> this is a tabletop RPG that... Um, was completely unlike anything else I had played at the time that I got it and played it with my game group, Sean included. Uh, Monsters and Other Childish Things is a game, basically take Pokemon and combine it with H.P. Lovecraft, and that in a nutshell, in a pretty big nutshell, is what <laughs> Monsters and Other Childish Things is. You play a kid. Um, they recommend between the ages of, like, seven and no older than, like, a sophomore in high school. And your kid... Has a monster. Think like 80s coming of age kids. Like you yeah, want this that's... to be like Stand By Me or Stranger Things. Yeah, the game that I ran, I ran it in I think 1994 or something or 98 or something like that because that to me was the, the theme or the feel that I wanted in this game. But you play a kid, your kid has a monster. This monster is really cool. He's not like any other monsters. Uh, other people can't see him. He has a way to hide from, from like adults and people who don't have monsters. But there are other kids who have monsters. And not only that, there are monsters that exist in the world that are harmful. Um, and it's you and your friend's job, because you guys all have monsters, to go out and kick these bad monsters' butts. And there's people that want to catch monsters and study them. There's um, mad science. There's men in black. There's all these different facets of it that you can kind of pick and choose what you want to play. Um, it's a very interesting system, a uh, very interesting setting, and it really... Uh, provides the GM and the players with some cool opportunities to role play in ways that they, they may not be used to because you're playing kids and you're playing monsters that are emotionally bonded to these kids. So, yeah. Oh, and then... Um, what, what's, the, what's the name of the example monster in... Oh, there's a bunch of... one of. Okay, so in one of our episodes I talked about this previously, um, uh, there is a monster, there's a little girl who has a monster teddy bear and the teddy bear's name is Yog So Soft. So <laughs> yes. that's great. There's also um, a monster called Mr. Whispers, who is literally a legion of rats that all speak in whispers at the same time. So it's like... <laughs> <laughs> and then um, one of our group's favorites is a monster who goes by the name of Bug Nuts. And it's basically yes. a giant a giant fly <laughs> um, that a little change I put on it was that he lives inside of his kid's nose and the kid has to like like do a snot rocket to get the monster to come out and then it grows from there. But anyway, 
very cool RPG. And I see that Josh in our Discord is asking me to shout out to Little Fears. Um, again, where it's an RPG where you play a kid and monsters are a real thing they have to deal with. I haven't played Little Fears, so I can't speak to that one per se. But Josh has done a great job on um, selling it to me as far as talking it up. So uh, I don't have that conversation in front of me, unfortunately. But that would be one <laughs> to check out as well. Awesome. Well, for my part... Um, I would recommend that anyone who likes this game and is also a fan of the Middle Earth setting to check out the progenitor of this game. As much as we love to, to talk about how this game is awesome, it owes a lot to the Lord of the Rings LCG. Yeah. Uh, the Lord of the Rings LCG is a little bit more of a card game. So while you know, Arkham kind of blends the lines between a card game and an RPG, Lord of the Rings is primarily a card game with some RPG elements if you choose to take on the campaign mode. And, uh, you know, it's 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 a fantastic game. You get to choose your heroes. You get to take on any number of quests that take place in just about every corner of Middle-earth at this point. Uh, I think we're missing Dale. And my Middle-earth geography runs out at that point. But anyway, it's a fantastic <laughs> game. So if you really like the idea of a cooperative card game uh, in the you know in the vein of, of Arkham, I would definitely also look at Lord of the Rings LCG. A uh, very easy comparison or a very easy recommendation if you're into Arkham is Eldritch Horror, which is kind of FFG's, I don't want to call it like Arkham Horror Board Game 2nd Edition because it doesn't do everything exactly the same, but it's, it's basically... basically is. It kind of is. It takes everything that Arkham Horror, the board game by FFG, did and kind of puts it on the world global scale. And it kind of simplifies it. And honestly, it's, it's just, to me, it's it's a much better game in that it kind of loses a lot of the fiddliness that Arkham Horror, the board game, has. And uh, there's, there's lots of expansions you can add to its side maps. And you can go to Antarctica and Egypt and the Dreamlands now. Very fun game. It's probably, as far as board games as, as a group goes, Elder Shore is probably my favorite. The only thing that I have against it is how freaking long it can take sometimes. Um, and then in addition to that, as far as we're talking about cooperative card games, another one that I would mention to people is Sentinels of the Multiverse, which recently Nick and I got uh, the chance to play quite a bit. Um, <laughs> Sentinels of the Multiverse is a really cool kind of proprietary superhero property that's, that's done by Greater Than Games. Um, it's, it's co-op and again, it's very similar in that it has a very specific villain deck that kind of runs itself and, and pits itself against the players that each take on a specific superhero. The one difference there is that there is no deck building in Sentinels of the Multiverse. You pick a hero and you get that hero's deck to play. Um, it's, it's, it's a lot, a lot more on the simplest side. It's a little bit more of like a, a damage management game as opposed to something like Arkham where there's actually a board that you're moving around and gathering clues and kind of all these different aspects going on. So it's a little bit more on the light side, but definitely still fun and worth checking out. So guys, I think we're going to have to put a bow on this one after two hours and about 45 minutes. <laughs> well, we can't, we can't hit three hours. Come on. <laughs> we tried hard. We tried hard, oh. but we were, we failed. We pulled the tentacle token in that regard. So, um, thank you for sticking through this. Uh, hopefully, at least we tried to structure this in in the idea that the the start or the the parts at the start of the episode were the most salient, and we kind of dribbled down from there to the the least salient <laughs> to new players in this card game. Um, so, if you stuck through it to the end, well done. You've got the stamina of a racehorse, and hopefully, you'll join us again for more episodes. We're putting out episode sixteen in a couple weeks which will be on some awesome topic yet to be determined. And, uh, guys, any any final words before we close this episode? Ian? No, play the game, enjoy the game. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> Nick? Uh, thanks for listening this long, guys. I'm surprised I stayed on to talk this long. <laughs> I wouldn't have let you leave. <laughs> Just walk away. All right, <laughs> Jaws walk away um, guys thank you for joining us on episode 15 of Mythos Busters the newbie episode and we will hopefully if you haven't quit on us at this point see you next time mm -hmm.